Welcome to today's Archer virtual tutorial. This is going to be about version control. Okay, so this is going to be a, an introduction to version control. Uh, roughly speaking, there's going to be two parts. The first part, uh, we're just going to give an introduction to, to why we would want to use version control systems. Um, I'll tell you about some of the common concepts and terminology underlying a lot of version control systems. Um, I'll do a simple demonstration, live demonstration using uh, SVN, which is a, one of the one of, uh, common version control systems. I'll say a bit about um, words of warning and um, give a practical demonstration. And then part two, we'll discuss some other aspects. So, um, the question is, why do we need version control? So it's, it's really a question of, of workflow and how we manage um, files that we produce. So if you imagine simply having a, a text document, um, like, a, like a publication that you're writing, you'll start out with a paper draft. I think I activate a pointer. And now when I point, people should be able to see a cursor on the screen, on the slide where I'm pointing. If that's not the case, let me know in the chat window. So you start out with a paper draft and you make some modifications. Uh, you get draft version two. Now you could just keep keep adding to the same file. Of course, you're just writing the document as it goes along. But you could at some point say, well, I'm going to make it make uh, make quite drastic change. Oh, you're not seeing the cursor. Okay. Um, pointer. Let's try that. And there should be a pointer. Okay. So you. So you make some changes to your paper draft, you get, come up with a new version. Now you can just, as I said, keep on adding text cumulatively, and it's just one file, one document that you keep on adding to. But you could decide to make quite a drastic change, try out a, a totally different structure, um, and you might be tempted to just save that as a separate file, so you have your alternative draft two of the paper. Uh, and then you actually go back and you continue that first that one draft two and you make you make a draft three so you, so and then what happens is well you're writing this paper not just by yourself but together with a couple of your colleagues Alice and Bob so what you do is well you say okay Alice you need to add in your stuff on whatever whatever you were doing Bob needs to add in your stuff on whatever you were doing so you send them uh, copies of the uh, of the file you know you might email them the file as an attachment. Uh, and Alice puts in some stuff from her, and Bob puts in some stuff, and you put in some, make some further changes, into, and it makes it into draft number four. Then finally, in the end, before you send this paper out to publication, you're gonna have to somehow combine all these changes. Uh, it might be fairly easy if each, you know, each of your colleagues and you yourself as well is just editing one subsection, uh, one section in the paper. It's fairly straightforward. You just um, put the sections together to make the final document. But it's a bit more complicated if, say, um, multiple people were contributing to the same uh, section, uh, different paragraphs, or even within the same paragraph, different bits of paragraph. So some of these changes all need to be combined. And you might want to incorporate some stuff from the earlier draft from yourself as well, from draft number two alternative. Now this is maybe not, doesn't seem like such a, people do it, um, but alternative to having people add uh, your colleagues adding stuff at, at the same time to their own copies is to, to use a so-called rights token where you say um, uh, I have the right token or you say I, I'm writing this, the I'm adding to the draft now I'm going to send my okay I want Alice to add stuff but only Alice will be able to add stuff at the moment so Alice has the rights token nobody else can write the document she makes some changes and then she emails it on to Bob who then makes some changes um, the advantage being there that uh, they have to, there's, there's no different versions of the document, it's just one single canonical version. Um, and integration of people's contributions happens uh, as they go, as, as they themselves add them. Uh, but of course, the disadvantage of that approach is that it takes more time to get stuff done because you're serially <laughs> you're processing the document serially. What I mean is you're having one person add contributions, then the next person add contributions after the first person's finished, etc. Now, uh, there's actually, of course, tools that allow you to, to do this, uh, like in, in Word and in Google Documents and things like that, word processing documents. Now, have options like track changes, you know, you can, people can make changes and these can be 
create it uh, approved later. So there's, there's facilities around to, to, to do that. And in fact, things like tracking changes is, is a type of version control for, for documents. But that's all pertaining to documents. It gets a lot more complicated when um, you get to come to code. Um, you have a similar picture, some initial code in the file that works, then you make a version that goes faster. And you also try to make, you think, okay, I'll try actually a totally different algorithm and different version of the code. Uh, and now the, the key thing is, well, okay, so your, your colleagues might also write, write some code and contribute some code, and you yourself will make some, some changes. And finally, there's all have to be combined into one file, or rather set of files. Um, you see the icons showing, because the idea here is that in code, you typically got a code base. You've got a, not just one file, like in a document, but you've got a whole um, directory for files of code different functionality that will need to be somehow combined when you compile the code um, into, into one or more executables or libraries. So the, the need for version control is much clearer here. So in other words, the problems that can arise um, from trying to integrate changes and make sure that changes that, that different files work together uh, is much more apparent. So what's, what's the problem with, with, with doing this kind of manually? Well, you, Ends up with lots of different files, might be named different things, kind of nightmare. Uh, to be a bit more precise, the problem is that you need to keep, have some kind of way of keeping track of uh, what's in each file or what's in each version of each, fi each file. And also, uh, especially when it comes to source code, how versions of the same file are related and how different uh, versions of different files are related, so code dependencies. So in order, of course, for your code uh, to compile without any errors and also with your with the expected functionality, the function calls from one uh, source code file to another source code file must uh, must work, must have the right number of art, right function names, must have the right number of arguments, uh, pass the right number of things and return the right, the right number of things and types of things. So you need to have some way of keeping track of all of this. The question is how do we do this? Do we record this? Um, as comments in the files, we will record this information in, in file, name, file names themselves. If we have different versions of files, do we use directory structure or some other some other way? But that's really where version control comes in. By the way, I should add if you have any questions at any point, just um, just type in the chat window or raise. Uh, I think you can raise a question. There's a little icon at the bottom of the screen. Raise hand. So. We'll um, uh, well, a challenge is to, to, to man yet you have to, if you don't use an automatic tool for this, you need to manually merge these, these versions to produce you know, a final version. Um, that can be because you edited copies of the file in different places, or other people edit, edit the files. So um, doing this manually, by whatever system you choose to devise that still requires you, you, you to manually uh, check things, is A, very time consuming, B, quite error prone, and when the number of files expands for large and larger codes and, and the number of collaborators on the code um, expands and the, the time scale in which you're doing things expands, this becomes just simply unmanageable. Um, so you need some kind of way of, of automating this, some way of, of uh, doing this systematically in a consistent uh, way. Now, version control systems are tools that provide this. Um, so they're tools that provide framework to record meaningful information about the versions, to do so in a consistent and systematic way, and to track um, how, how things change over time, what the differences are between uh, different files or the same file over time, and how, to, um, and how, these, how these changes um, happen. Uh, they also allow you to uh, basically take snapshots of files to save, in a sense, checkpoint or save um, the versions of files as you go along. So it really, these tools are really very helpful for incremental development where you do a little bit of work, uh, for example, in programming to make sure that you, do, you introduce some new functionality. And um, once that little bit of functionality works, you then uh, record a snapshot of that as a sort of a version uh, or a revision. And you can, you can then say to someone else, okay, if you want a version that works, use this, use this version. And version control tools, version control systems make this um, easy. So, um, so this allows you to also capture, uh, preserve the dependencies between particular versions of files. So if you have 
not just one file that has particular functionality that, that works, but say two or three files that run that have to correspond in terms of their functions or arguments or variables, um, making sure that you have the, 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 the set of set of versions of these files that all work together, captures as a single snapshot in a systematic way is important. And that's what these version control systems allow you to do. So, um, so, so as I said, they provide, provide snapshots, which can act like a safety net. Say you, say you lose your files, it's also a way of sometimes backing up stuff. Um, and they allow, allow you and your collaborators, including new collaborators, to easily create and synchronize uh, files, uh, including uh, in multiple locations. So um, you're avoiding error-prone manual transferring of files and, and, and needing to keep track of names. Uh, which is a backup and allows you to easily use uh, distributed or different computing infrastructures in different places, different machines, your own laptop, departmental machine, uh, a machine like Archer. Um, so what, what version control systems really enable is uh, efficient, um, efficient and uh, less error prone <laughs> collaborative work on the same set of files at the same time uh, in a way that uh, also automatically identifies contributions coming from different collaborators. There's all kinds of software development workflows that emerge from this which we'll come to to, to cover later on in the uh, in session uh, in, se in the second part. So one of the things that we can do, um, one of the kind of workflows and as fundamental models in, um, in, 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 in using version control systems is that thanks to this automated uh, tracking of, of versions and check, tracking of changes between versions, we can easily um, do what we call branching, which is where you cr create, a, um, at some point, you create, a, 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 say, a copy of a set of files, copy of a set of file, of a file or a set of files, and you modify the set of files with a particular goal in mind. So you might create a, a copy of your set of files that are going to, for example, implement some new functionality. Um, so the idea of the branch is obviously like a branch, like a river, a branch of a tree, uh, things grow organically, uh, you, you make these changes and then um, you can then uh, uh, later, at a later stage um, combine the changes that you made to one copy of the set of files, i.e. to one branch, with whatever changes have been made to the original copy of the set of files, which is often referred to as the, the master branch or the trunk, trunk of the tree. Um, you can then integrate these, and, and um, as you can imagine, integrating these changes, what I mean is, in, by integrating, I mean combining uh, the changes made to these two different copies of sets of files into once again having one copy of the set of files that then, you know, your final copy in, in, in terminology introduced earlier, the final copy that will do something. For example, the final copy will compile successfully, final copy of the set of source files will compile successfully and will include functionality that you introduced in this new branch, as well as the functionality that was originally there in the master branch or in the trunk, um, and possibly other branches as well. So version control systems allow this, uh, these kind of workflows. Um, one important thing that you can also get from version control systems is that when it comes to computational science and uh, research, any research that uses any kind of software really, is that the, the version information, um, keeping the version information allows you, when you are publishing results, uh, to um, refer directly to the particular version of the, of, the, of the software that produced those results. So that really aids in, um, re in, in aiding, facilitating reproducible computational research. Um, so ideally, if you if you make, if you publish something, publish a paper using a particular piece of software, you won't just say, "Oh, we use this piece of software, and these are the results." We use this piece of software revision number or version number, this, this, and that. Um, and uh, yeah, that pretty much facilitates research, and also makes it easier to test and develop 
uh, things. So for example, when I mentioned branching, introducing new functionality, uh, you could do this, you can, you can do this um, as, a, as a tentative step, which uh, doesn't affect the, fun the, 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 the proper operation of the main code base. Uh, you can introduce new functionality in a, in a separate branch, separate copy of the set of files, test it, and once it works, only then um, combine those changes into the, uh, into the master. So um, that's still very general, kind of setting the scene for why, why we want these kinds of systems. Now let's discuss a bit about uh, what are, let's name them, some of these some of the common version control systems. There are a lot of different systems out there, uh, given that you're in this tutorial or interested in this tutorial. I imagine you may have, you may have already come across uh, one or more. Um, so uh, let's start beginning. So uh, CVS, which stands for Congruent Versioning Systems, is quite an old one, very mature. Uh, it's not as popular anymore now, certainly not for new software development projects, but it still is kicking around in, in places, uh, still used. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, can you raise your hand if you've come across, well, if you've yourself used CVS? It's a little icon, a little raise hand icon at the bottom of the screen, so kind of out of curiosity. So that's Claire saying she's used it. Nobody else has used CVS? Okay. Um, fine. Okay. Uh, next, uh, SVN, which stands for well, uh, subversion. That's a raised hand for subversion. I'm assuming. Okay. So tons of people have so a few, few people have used SVN anyway. Um, so it was it came after CBS, and it's still somewhat widespread. It's it's certainly more flexible uh, and efficient than CBS, uh, particularly at handling non-text files. So CBS is really from from back in the day. And, and by comparison with modern version control systems, really seems a bit clunky sometimes. Um, it's simple, but it works. Um, it's SVN is, 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 is a lot uh, is easier to use, a bit, bit more intuitive, I would argue. Um, Git, who's used Git? Yeah, one, two, three. Okay, so some people have used Git. Um, yeah. Um, so Git is as uh, you know, it's a bit more recent and um, has really gained lots of traction. It's become extremely popular. Um, it is very powerful, very flexible. It can handle lots of complex workflows. Um, it's extremely popular for many uh, new software development projects. Not not um, not just or not even necessarily within computational science, but all, but really with software development much more widely, including in, um, you know, uh, large companies, uh, tech companies, um, Silicon Valley, a uh, whole startup scene, um, everybody put, puts their code up on GitHub, which I'll come to later. So GitHub is a website, website that um, uh, hosts people's uh, files managed by Git. So that, that this website has led to widespread popularity of Git. Who's used Mercurial? Has anybody used Mercurial? One, two, okay. Right. Yeah, it's not it's not that common. Um, it's a it's a bit it incorporates some features, some flexibility that Git has, but it is also um, uh, it is a lot simpler in some ways to use. So just a little um, get a little idea. It's not very system, not very sort of. Uh, Thorough, maybe thoroughly researched, but as a very rough indication, if you simply do a Google Trends search for the uh, occurrence of search terms, of common search terms using uh, the uh, three uh, of these version control systems, CVS, SVN, and Mercurial, going back to 2004 up until the present day, you can see that CVS from 2004 has declined uh, massively in, in popularity, really kind of exponential fall off, and around uh, whatever it was, 2006, halfway 2006, was you was to search for about as frequently as SVN, and you can see the SVN has become a lot more popular since 2004, but seems to also kind of be uh, decreasing a bit. Mercurial has seen a very has seen a steady kind of rise level, slightly above SVN now, uh, about the same. Uh, however, if you then introduce, uh, if you look at Git, 
if you include in this picture git, and you'll see why I've included it separately, is namely it, it, it um, mass massively exceeds uh, the popularity of, of all of these, uh, these judged by, by search terms. Now, if you're judging, if you're going by search terms, you could argue that perhaps one of the reasons why there's so many, so many search results for so many searches for Git is because Git is difficult to use, so people are looking very often for how, how to use Git correctly. But that's a bit um, uh, skeptical. Uh, it is genuinely extremely popular. So, okay. So what I want to do now is uh, introduce some of the common core concepts and some of the terminology that underlies. Uh, a lot of different, lot of these different version control systems. So, um, although I'll give a bit of a sort of demo later on with S and with, with Git as well in part two, um, I don't want to focus too much on the on the exact syntax of a, of a particular version control system. But this, in this tutorial, I really want to give you an idea of the common concepts uh, that will allow you to kind of understand, you know, if you're well, regardless of whether you're already using a version control system or or yet to begin, uh, to really allow you to understand the underlying Kind of conceptual models uh, that will hopefully help you figure out whether what you're doing makes sense or whether what you want to do makes sense. Um, and when things go wrong, it allows you to kind of realize, okay, yeah, I see what's going on, it's because this or that. So, concepts and terminology. Uh, the first concept, most important concept, I would argue, is that of a repository. So, short, abbreviated sometimes as repo. So, repository or repo is. Um, essentially, the complete archive or history of all the files and all the versions of the files that have ever been upshotted um, during uh, its use. Um, so that includes how these how these versions of files are related in terms of the changes between one and the other. So a repository is based basically the, um, this, the, the the data store. So it's where everything, uh, all the files. Uh, information about uh, the files and their history lives. Um, so to check out, to check out or to clone in the case of Git means to grab uh, a copy of a repository and to um, duplicate it uh, locally uh, as what is sometimes referred to as often referred to as, as a working copy. So uh, the idea being that um, you, as somebody who, who wants to either view these, well, wants to view these these files, the source code, you check out or clone a copy of the repository locally on, on your machine or on the machine that you're using and logged into, um, and then work with that working copy, edit it, and then later on somehow uh, we integrate those changes with uh, with the repository or repositories, as we shall see. Um, oh, no, no, okay. So, sorry, is there, Andreas, did you have a question? If there's any question, if you do have a question, please uh, just type in the, type in the chat. Um, the working copy, okay, so the working copy is, um, is the set of use your copy of the set of files. If you've only just checked out a cloned repository, then it will be identical. The contents of those files will be identical to the ones that are in the repository. But as you make changes, obviously this, this starts to diverge from, from what is in the repository. Uh, okay. So a few more terms. Commit. To commit or a commit. So to commit means to basically take a snapshot. So to commit means that you're recording the current state of a file or a set of files that are in your working copy uh, and committing them to the repository. So that, that's saying that meaning you're taking a snapshot and you're storing that snapshot in, in the repository um, as a version or a vision uh, or, or a commit. You can say this is this, you know, I made a commit, this this is this is the commit, uh, you know, numbered commits, for example. This, so this transfers, so this action transfers data from your working copy. To the repository. Uh, a log is a record of uh, all the snapshots that were taken at different times, um, and that includes uh, typically which files were changed, the timestamp when this was done, 
the contributor who actually made the changes, who made the snapshot, um, and hopefully, often also, uh, meaningful comments by the person who made the changes. The, the staging area uh, is a concept that, that sometimes comes in. Uh, with some version control systems, you, um, you have to um, select, explicitly select which files you are going to commit. Uh, and these then get added to so-called staging area, and then when you commit, it is only those files that are in the staging area that will actually be committed, whose changes will then actually be committed to the repository. Adding means to add a file or files to the staging area, uh, typically. Okay, a branch we already discussed. So a branch is essentially just um, sort of a stream of changes to a, to a copy of a set of files. Um, so I talked about why you might want to create a branch. So when you create a branch, the original copy of the set of files is left unchanged, and any changes you make can be done purely to that, to that branch. And you can have uh, many uh, different branches. Um, and switch between them and make changes only to a particular branch at any given time. Merging. Merging means uh, combining uh, two versions of a file um, um, in, into one. So typically when you, um, when you make changes to, to a file, and if you are either um, updating, so update is the next, next concept, uh, updating just means grabbing the latest version of files from the repository and get, getting them in, grabbing them into your transferring them into your local working copy. And obviously, if you have made changes to your, to a file in your working copy and you're grabbing uh, the latest state in the repository, that might be different. So what, you, what needs to happen then is these two uh, versions of a file need to be merged, uh, and this is something that can happen automatically if there is no, if uh, these changes are made to different, um, typically to different, typically to different lines in the file. But if these are changes made to the same line in the file, that will require explicit action by you yourself. So a version control tool will typically present you with a choice saying, okay, I've noticed that there are changes, there's a difference between these two, file, between these two versions of the file. You're requesting to merge them you will have to do so explicitly, and you will have to tell me what the end result should be. So version control systems, systems aren't magic, so magic, magic bullets, silver bullets. They don't know what, how, they don't necessarily know how to combine things. They just are really good at systematically tracking when things are different, and then giving you, presenting you in an efficient way, quick way, uh, the, the place where they are different, and then asking you to decide what the, uh, merged results should be. So when you do this merge, um, or when you try to update, you can get conflicts. Same thing can happen when, you tr when you've made your changes and you try to to um, uh, what we call uh, push, uh, or, or can sometimes simply be the commit itself. When you're pushing changes from your working copy to the repository, at that time there might also be a conflict which um, will need to be resolved and as I said, it just needs to be resolved manually. So you need to think about what's going on. And you, you need to decide what matters and what the end result should be. So um, I'll give a little demonstration using SVN. Uh, let's see. So we're going to uh, check out an existing repository, uh, look at the log, create a file, file, make a change, let's make a change. So let me see um, if I, um, okay, I might actually work with the existing repository. It's rather more convenient. We'll check out a we'll check out a, a repository fresh later on as well. So that's fine. So I'm going to change screens and share an application. Um, so. So you can see an empty screen. Uh, anybody, if that's too small for anybody to read, please let me know. I might make it a bit bigger anyway. Make this bigger. Okay, so I said uh, I would, um, I'm not gonna check out an existing repository. I'm going to 
uh, navigate to a place in my file system where I have already checked out an existing repository. So uh, I am going to enter. So I have entered a directory called EPCC training. This is uh, a, wor um, a working copy that resides on my laptop of a repository called EPCC training. It was a, oh, a little bit bigger, please. Okay. And da, 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 da. How about that? Okay. Yeah. So what I've done is I've entered a directory called EPCC training. That's simply a folder on my machine, on my laptop, and that's a working copy that I have already checked out of a repository that lives somewhere. And we'll discuss later on where repositories live. Um, so I've entered that directory and inside the directory, you can see there's, uh, there's uh, four folders, a folder called branches, a folder called tags, a folder called temp, and a folder called trunk. Actually, the temp, temp folder might just be something that I've created possibly. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's right. So what I've done, what I just did was um, I typed um, a command SVN, uh, which is the, uh, so, so this, so I should have said this is, a, this is an SVN um, repository. I've checked it, I've checked it out using SVN and I've, and I've issued, issued the command SVN status. So status is a, is a useful co uh, command to remember. It's used in uh, not just in SVN, but also um, Git um, and CPS. And what, it, what the status tells you typically is um, how your local working copy differs from the repository. So I've typed SVN status and you can see that there's one question mark for temp. Now temp is a folder. I think I created it. Question mark for SVN means um, I, this, this is not part of the repository. However, it is in your working copy. I don't know what, what you want to do with it. <laughs> so um, I don't really know. The, when I say I, I mean, I mean SVN. So SVN doesn't really know um, what to do with it. Same applies to uh, a directory created in the path here. And that is actually a directory which I created for today's virtual tutorials. That's, that's a new directory. So, but then there's, uh, there's three other uh, lines in this output. Um, this one, this one, and the bottom one, let's say M, so M, stands in SVN, lingo stands for modified. So what that, what SVN is telling me there is that these files were, um, are already actually in the repository. However, the local copy in my working directory is, has been modified relative to that in copy. Um, so, okay, what I'm going to do is, um, yeah, it's actually, it's actually perfect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate. Um, what, I, what I will do is actually I will add the directory for today's version tutorial, uh, version control tutorial to the repository. But um, before I do that, I wanted to say something about the um, structure of this, of this working copy. You can see there's directories, branches, tags, tags, and trunk. Temp is just something that, that, that I created for whatever reason, but branches, tags, and trunk is a typical layout for an SVN repository. Uh, this is uh, optional, it's, it's just a convention. Um, trunk basically means that's where by default everything lives, all the, all the files live. Branches can contain copies of sets of files. Um, so if you create a branch, you typically create it within this branches directory. Um, Tags corresponds to uh, copies of sets of files that, that are like uh, releases of software, for example. But the main thing that you typically find, the main thing you need to know to where you typically find um, code will be in trunk. So I'm going to go to trunk, and I'm going to actually go to this um, subdirectory that, that has the uh, version that says virtual tutorial in it. I'm going to issue the SVN status command in that directory. And you, there you can see the only thing that pops up is that within this directory, it finds that version control um, uh, folder. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say SVN. Um, so I would like to uh, commit uh, this, um, I'd like to commit that I'm going to add this folder and the files within it to the repository. 
Now to do that, I need to say SVN add. If I simply do name of the uh, folder, then what it will do is um, it said uh, add and say okay, status A A A A for add. It's going to it's going to SVN is going to add the folder as well as these three files within it to the repository. Uh, bin here stands for binary because these are PowerPoint slides, which it says is not plain text, but some other format that it doesn't quite recognize as anything in particular. So um, what I can do then is, so the key thing to recognize here is that what I've not yet done is I've not yet added these to the repository. What I've done is I've told SVN that, I, that um, I'm going to add these to the repository. So um, to actually add them to the repository, I need to commit with the command svn commit. And if I simply were to do this now, it would prompt me, if I would press enter now, it would prompt me with a command saying, please provide a meaningful message for this commit, telling us a message that will go in the log to accompany this commit saying, uh, for future reference, what was the point of this commit and what, did you, you know, what does it include basically? I can um, shortcut that process by simply using the dash n flag for message. Again, the exact syntax isn't that important, um, though it may come in useful for you. You may recognize it. I just want to give, give the idea. So the message that I will pass along is saying, uh, edit uh, version control, version control tutorial, edit 2017 version control for tutorial. Okay. You can see what's happening now, transmitting file data. So what's happening is that it's actually trans, it's actually uh, uploading these files um, somewhere. Well, the, uh, I'm saying it's adding it, it's committing them to the repository. It, these files, this data has actually been transmitted uh, and a new revision has been created. So if I type SVN, um, I'm going to look at a log. If I type SVN log, Simply press enter now, I'm going to get a massively long log going back to the way way back in history. I use an option to just show the last few uh, changes that have been made. Ah, no. I can see that there's a few changes here that were made. Um, a few different revision numbers. You can see R2050, R2019. So these were changes that were made, uh, commits that were made to the repository uh, within this directory, which I'm in now. Um, you can see that, okay, so this is the revision number that I'm highlighting, R2050. DSH is the um, alias or username of the person who made these, these, these commits. Uh, the date, timestamp, um, and number of lines that were changed. And there's no, there's, no, there's no actual message included here in any of these commits saying what it is. And if I do SVN update, um, I am going to actually, so it, it just so happens that with SVN, the, the log uh, is kept, um, in the repository and as well as locally, but you need to update your local working copy, actually be able to see the latest state of the log. So if I do SVN update, that will get the latest version of the repository into my working copy. And if I type then SVN log dash L5 again, I should see, yes, now I see there's a new um, uh, new commit. In fact, there's two new commits. Um, uh, oh yes, because of the previous one, which I hadn't yet uh, updated. So you can see that is R2160, which was mentioned after we transmitted the data, is now reflected in the in the log that I see when I issue this command. So this was a, the, the commit that I just made. So um, let's see, what we want to do is clear files, commit files. Okay, so this essentially, is, I think this, this covers a sort of simple, simple example of how SVN works. We're not going to go into, into details with regards to uh, merging different versions of files. That's a bit complicated. If I type SVN info, it will tell me a bit about um, this repository. For example, it will tell me, and here's a hint actually, what we'll talk about later on, where the repository lives. So actually you can see here that it says repository root is uh, an HTTPS address um, at, at, at HTTPS. So this is actually where the repository lives. So this lives on a server somewhere at the University of Edinburgh. Okay. So I'm just going to move away from that uh, and continue. But if there's any questions, if anybody has any questions right now, just about what I've shown 
So far, this uh, if we can say something in the chat. Just wait a second. Okay, so I'm going to switch back to slides. Uh, so I'll do that slide. Um, right, so we've done some of these things. We've shown a basic, basic operation of SVN. Now, the question I said, where do repositories live? Where do repositories live? Well, they can live on a public hosted um, uh, server, on a, on a shared machine, uh, on a publicly hosted website, for example, um, uh, GitHub, which, which we'll get to, Bitbucket. These are, these are just websites where people can store repositories and, and manage them, and then um, uh, check them out locally onto their own laptop or desktop or, or a machine that they're logged into. Uh, or on a shared machine within the research group or, or institution. Um, or actually, repositories can also live on your own desktop or laptop. Um, this isn't quite as easy to set up with CVS and SVN, but it is uh, kind of the basic model, the default model with uh, Git. We'll talk about this more in, in part two. Um, so as I said, you still need to, when you're using project control systems, you still need to actually decide a little bit how to manage things. The, the tools just make it easier to do so. And when you're working collaboratively on uh, software on a set of files with different people, you still need to communicate about um, what, uh, what is desired in terms of emerging changes. So there probably there will be a scripted practical with some bit more so you can practice using SVN that will be up on the Archer website. There's a historical version of an earlier virtual, uh, uh, virtual tutorial on virtual control. That will see how you can show you how you can use SVN to, to do various things, including creating branches and merging changes. Um, now, in part two, we're going to look at um, uh, something more about two basic models of version control systems, namely centralized and distributed models. And this goes uh, back to where the repositories live. Um, also, do a bit of Git, um, and we'll consider which version control system you might want to use. Okay, sorry for that interruption. So I'll continue with uh, this, this part two. Um, so as you saw in uh, part one, I just described some common features of virtual control systems, kind of introduction. Now we're going to talk about um, two different models, centralized version control and distributed version control. And say a bit about workflows and about um, hosting uh, things like GitHub basically and also a bit about how to use a version control system. So there's two basic models uh, in version control, that's centralized version control and distributed version control. Um, again, feel free to interrupt me at any point if I'm either speaking too fast or uh, if anything is unclear. So examples of centralized version control, um, with a, with a basic client server model are CVS and SVN. The model there is that the repository lives on a central server and each user checks out a local working copy of that repository. So here, in the, I've, I've indicated, um, let's see, yeah, pointer, pointer. R123 means revision 123 or version 123. So the, the repository as a whole is at revision 123 and um, and the users, Alice and Bob, both have version 1, 2, 3 of the repository. But each user has a working copy. If, there's, if some new users go along, like Carol and Dave, uh, they seem to check out uh, their own fresh working copies of that repository. Now, what happens if people make changes? So say um, Alice makes some changes, starting from version 1, 2, 3, and Bob makes some changes also starting from version one, two, three. So they each have made their own changes. Um, now Alice will do basically what um, what I did in the example. For example, with SVN, she will say SVN commit these changes, which then get transmitted to the to the remote repository, to the central server, get logged, 
and register in stored, stored as snapshot R124. Now what happens when Dave, oh, sorry, uh, Bob <laughs> tries to commit the, uh, his changes is that uh, he gets, he basically gets runs through a problem. So the first person to commit the changes wins, and that's what gets report, report, recorded in the repository as, as a new version 124. When Bob tries to commit his changes, um, there's a problem. So he must essentially first grab the changes from the repository, namely the analysis changes, into his local working copy. And in that process, there will, might be some conflicts that you will have to resolve. You will have to decide what the merged result, what the merged result result is. And once he has resolved these conflicts, he can then uh, commit the merged result to the repository as version one two five. So other users like Alice and Dave and Carol will then uh, synchronize their local copy um, to reflect the changes that Bob um, first result that Bob committed to the repository. So you can see it's a centralized model, uh, and and basically there there is one canonical repository that all users uh, update from or check out from and commit to. This, the workflow that this naturally enforces is a centralized workflow with a kind of a, a linear sort of global progress view of, of the state of the repository, namely with a linear, I mean, in, in incrementing revision numbers. Um, now, what, what is also needed with this model is that um, if you ever want to update uh, your own co working copy or commit changes, you need to be online, right? you need to be able to connect to the machine that hosts the central canonical repository do this. Um, the past versions of files are typically not stored locally. You need to be online or connected to this repository to check out past committed versions of files and sometimes also to check the revision history. Um, also, what it means is that in order to take a snapshot, that snapshot gets pushed to a place where it's visible by any, everybody who is allowed to have access to that repository. So if you're doing something um, experimental, something, you know, um, something which is a bit tentative. People sometimes are a bit reticent to commit things because they know that when they commit things, this will be visible to all um, and it might not work. So people might be discouraged from committing things that aren't completely, completely fully working or completely finished. In other words, what that means is it, it discourages people from saving things or, or, or snapshotting things as they go along as much. It doesn't have to, depending on your agreement and your convention, but it can be. And it can also discourage creating lots of different branches. Um, well, there's nothing fundamental stepping in the way of that. Uh, okay, communicating with the server also costs time, so it's a bit of an overhead with regards to uh, if you're transmitting lots of data, grabbing lots of data. And also the server becomes a single point of failure, it needs to be configured correctly, it needs to be maintained. If it's down and suddenly nobody can, can commit their work or see other people's changes, um, backups and issues, issues of security as well. So, so then we get to distributed version control. Um, examples of this model, examples of systems that use this model are Git um, and also Mercurial. Here, each user actually has their own um, repository copy of the repository stored locally. So the distinction between working copy the repository gets blurred a bit here because actually there is no single canonical repository. Uh, in principle, everybody has a repository somewhat on an equal basis, although often uh, people still designate a particular repository um, as a canonical one, uh, which then typically lives on a central server, just like in the um, centralized model. But in principle, um, this is a distributed model where each person has the entire repository stored locally on their machine, including all the past versions uh, of files 
um, and all the history files uh, and all the, the, the mold itself. So then, um, in the absence of a central repository, so in the absence of a central server, new users have to obtain uh, a repository in the first place by copying it or copying it from uh, somebody else. Then when people make changes, they will be making changes to their own repository. So when they make changes, they're not just making changes to a local working copy of a central repository, but they're making changes and when they commit those changes, the crucial difference with the, with the uh, centralized model is that they're committing to their uh, own repository, their own local repository. So what you get is loads of copies, loads of repositories that uh, have different um, uh, versions. So these changes can be committed either to the master branch or uh, to uh, some other some new branch. The reason why I'm making that distinction will become clear in a second because it affects how these changes are then merged. So what happens then is um, to somehow combine the content from the different repositories, uh, i.e. the changes from different people into a single end result, for example, for compiling an executable or whatever, uh, without, in the, in the absence of a central server, um, somebody has to then, for example, Dave, if Carol and Dave have both made changes, then somebody, for example, Dave, needs to take Carol's changes, Dave already knows about his own changes, and then use the version control tool to merge the changes from, from Carol and Dave's own changes. And that merged result will then be committed to Dave's repository. So the merged result as it stands is then only available in Dave's repository. If Carol, Alice, and Bob want to get the result of that merged um, repository, they will need to again uh, clone or check out uh, Dave's repository. And this is only absence of a central server. Alternatively, so as an alternative to Dave doing the merge, it could be that Alice, uh, as somebody who has, say, more of an oversight about sort of the code base as a whole, takes a copy of, of, of Carol's repository, um, so it pulls Carol's changes and Dave's changes, and then merges them within uh, her own repository and commits the merged result within her own repository. Then to share those merged results to, to Carol, Dave, and Bob, again, Carol, Dave, and Bob would need to pull the merged result from her repository. However, that's a bit um, uh, circuitous, and it can be difficult to set up this peer-to-peer -peer kind of format. So what is very often used is, is actually, again, a centralized uh, kind of uh, implementation of this, this model where there is a central server that hosts um, uh, a, co uh, a host a repository that you know might not be the canonical repository but it's a useful it's a repository that is you know, based on the same repo repositories as everybody else has it's just in one sense it's just another copy of the repository and then what happens is that um, to actually obtain the repository in the first place, Carol and Dave would clone or check out copies, just like they would in the centralized model. They make their changes and commit these changes to their own local repositories, as before in the distributed model. But now, um, they can push these changes um, to the server. So if the changes by Carol and Dave were both made to the so-called master branch within the repository, what happens is that we go back to the original situation with the centralized model where um, if they're both pushing these changes to the repository and the server, then whoever pushes first wins. So Carol's changes then get, get uh, put into the uh, master branch in the repository and the server. Dave then encounters um, a problem so that he will first have to pull Carol's changes from the server, merge them and commit that into his own repository, and then push the results back to the master branch on the server for others to use. 
If Carol and Dave made the changes not to the master branch, but to some new branch that they call, for example, Carol's branch and Dave called it Dave's branch, um, then uh, what happens is after uh, Carol and Dave both try to push to the server, Dave will actually succeed because they're pushing to different branches. And somebody, could be Dave, could be Carol, but could be Alice, needs to then merge. If, if, if those two branches, Carol's branch and Dave's branch, which are both available on the server, need to be merged, Alice could pull Carol and Dave's branches from the server, merge them, commit that merge result to our own repository, and then push that result back to a single branch on the server. And that branch that she pushes to could be the master branch, it could be Alice's branch, it could be whatever. Depends on what, what is desired. So you can see this, get, this can get a bit, uh, a bit complicated. It's a bit more complicated than a uh, centralized uh, model where you're definitely stuck to doing everything in this canonical repository. However, advantages are that you don't need to be online to commit changes because as you saw, Dave and Carol, anybody, can make, can commit changes to the repository which lives locally on their machine. So that means it's much easier to just simply take snapshots as we go along. Nobody else sees it, which maybe encourages people to commit experimental code. It's always good you know, in case you lose, well, if you lose something, you still want to <laughs> lose your laptop and then you lose the backup up somewhere else. But uh, the point is you can encourage just committing early, committing often, um, you have the full revision history available locally. Uh, and actually, you have a lot of flexibility in adopting different workflows than are uh, possible in a centralized model. We'll show some examples of, central, of different workflows that, that can operate with this model. Uh, and also, a lot of common operations are faster because you no longer need to communicate with the server. So, what can be really annoying is if you're um, each step having to communicate with the server, and it's just, it, feels, it feels quite, it's just, it's just quite, quite slick to do things locally. Um, and then only occasionally uh, push and pull to a to remote location. Oops, so, um, let's see. Now, yeah, a no, little aside which, which may be of interest. Um, it's slightly technical. You might ask, well, how does the version control system actually know how to merge the content from, from different repositories? Uh, in particular, how, do, how does it determine how far back to go in the revision history of two, two branches? If you're merging two branches, which have each have a series of each have a series of commits, and um, how does it know how far go back how far back in that history to go until it finds the common ancestor? Um, for example, you know, there's no single canonical repository. So there's no global revision number, there's no consistent numbering system for the changes in these different distributed copies that can be used to judge when uh, commit histories sort of diverge and, and therefore when they need to be, and to how far back the system needs to look to merge changes between two branches. The answer to the question of how to do this is distributed version control systems, they can compute a unique uh, identifier uh, identifying each commit that um, um, even better, we do even better than that, they can compute a unique identifier that identifies not only each commit but also its preceding within history. So we do this by using the hash function, so it generates a really unique um, accessible number. And if two commits from different repositories have the same ID, that that actually means that has that identifies that they definitely have the same identical revision histories uh, and hence our common ancestors. So this is how this, this is resolved. Uh, so for example, you have Carol's and Dave's branches. Then you can see the first, the first three commits. So each commit is, is numbered by some really long number, not just R123, but 40 digit or complex accessible number. And you can see that at some point, uh, the accessible number starts to differ, and then for the version control system, you can see that from that point onwards, the revision history is different. And these constitute, therefore, local commits that needs to, need to be merged. 
What are other advantages of distributed version control systems? Well, there's no, there's not necessarily need to set up and maintain a central server. You can just, um, you can just get going straight away on your own laptop. You just need to download the tool itself and get going. So there's that, that's an advantage. Uh, there's also no single point of failure. Um, you've got as many backups of the data as you do clones of the repository. They might be slightly out of sync with each other, depending on which users have, have, have updated uh, with, with each other or with the central repository if you're using that. But you have lots of backups. These hash IDs that I mentioned, they allow real exact verification of, of whether anything has been corrupted. And um, this, pay, this model also paves the way for the branching. Uh, branching, as, as I showed in the example of um, how changes are merged depending on whether they are committed to a single master branch or to individual branches. This affects um, the workflows for how changes are merged. So um, this gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of workflows. And both Mercurial and Git have very efficient implementations of, of doing branches, of comparing branches and of merging branches, and of communicating transmitting branches from the repository to another. Um, so it's quite, attract, quite, quite efficient. So uh, I said I'd say a bit about um, some additional features in hosting in particular. So I talk about, so I mentioned, I mentioned that Git um, in particular has become extremely popular um, as it was started off being used in 2005. And this is driven in a very large part by hosting, public hosting websites like GitHub. Um, so these basically, instead of requiring you to set up your own server or to, you know, it's all server to somehow synchronize um, people's distributed repositories. GitHub makes it extremely easy. And this has really fueled the trend and that people exploit this uh, potential of distributed version control. Um, what GitHub uh, and other solutions also offer is not just hosting the repositories uh, in a way that's accessible, easy to anybody who can go on the internet, um, but also they provide additional features that facilitate collaborative software development, uh, namely uh, some kind of wiki functionality that allows bug tracking, uh, allows people to submit issues that are, for example, if you're talking about software development projects, people can, can submit issues, anybody really can with an account can often submit an issue saying, I've got this problem with the code that can be linked to a particular version of the code as it appears in the repository shown on the website. Um, this can then be uh, uh, discussed in the yeah, you know, and then particular, and then, then collaborators to um, collaborators in the code and developers that contribute to the code can, in their own private copies, address these issues, address these bugs, fix these bugs, and then push these changes to the repository that lives on GitHub and, and, uh, and close off. Uh, a particular issue that's been raised by somebody and point out saying, okay, um, you raised this issue, it was resolved in this particular commit, so use the version of the code that's probably available in this commit and not any earlier. So this makes, makes things quite, quite open, uh, exposes, um, makes it very transparent uh, what's going on with the code. There's also something called uh, an additional feature on GitHub is uh, so called uh, forking and pull requests. Uh, we'll show forking in, in, in kind of brief demonstration of it. So the idea there is that um, if you uh, if you are uh, somebody who perhaps doesn't even know the original developers of the code, but you use a piece of software and you know you're a programmer uh, and you see that there's something wrong with the code or you would like to add some functionality, what you can often do and you can do in GitHub, you can Let's so called fork uh, the publicly hosted repository uh, from the original developers. And what forking means is simply taking your own copy, but in particular, it means taking your own copy that then still lives on that website on GitHub. Then you can clone that, check it out locally on your machine, and either fix something that you spotted 
or introduce some new functionality, code up some new functionality. You can commit that to your local repository, push that to your fork, to your copy on GitHub, and then even though you don't necessarily have permission to directly change the repository from the original developers, you have those changes you made in your fork and you can do what's called a pull request. And what that does is it sends a message from your copy on GitHub to the original copy, alerts the developers that are administrating the original copy to the changes that you've made, and it says, okay, here, um, these are some changes that might be useful. You can describe them and say, you know, um, why don't you, if, if you like these changes, go ahead and incorporate them to your code. And if, they, if the original developers of the code uh, administrate the original copy, approve this, and those changes simply get incorporated um, directly, those changes to the code get incorporated directly into the original repository. So these features really uh, facilitate collaborative software development. As well as GitHub, there are uh, solutions like GitLab, which is just a piece of software that basically allows you to create something like GitHub, uh, but then on a machine that you yourself host, which means you can have much more control about um, resources, uh, permissions, uh, visibility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of universities have uh, started setting up GitLab instances um, so that they don't own, so, so that people don't, researchers don't only have the option of going to GitHub, um, but can use a local, local resource. So I'll do a little demonstration. Uh, one of the last things I'll do is, is a demonstration using Git and GitHub. So we're going to find uh, the code repository, repository on GitHub. We're going to do what I just described, which is to fork, um, uh, fork copy on GitHub, check it out locally, Make changes, can make the changes, um, maybe create a new file, and then push these changes to the remote repository. So, uh, do that. I'll switch again to the uh, application uh, terminal screen. Uh, okay, so, the new window, I'm going to I'm going to log on to Archer. The reason I'm doing this in Archer rather than my laptop is, is just um, because my laptop is on Wi Fi, which means that cloning in the repository will be very slow. So, what I'm going to do is I can switch to from my terminal screen back to the browser because I want to find, show you this one. Um, so, right, so the browser. I'm going to go to GitHub, github.com. So on GitHub, I have an account, I'm logged in. But I don't, I don't actually need to have an account if I just want to uh, uh, view a repository or to clone it, check it out. I only need an account if I want to uh, make a copy um, for a repository on GitHub. And if I want to push things to GitHub. But I, I do have an account because that's what I want to do. So I know that there's a piece of software called CP2K, uh, it's a density functional theory code. I know that, uh, amongst other things, I've built a CP2K website. Different from the views, you see I can use a piece of software, how do I get it? I download it, bring you to the download page. I can either download particular releases, uh, official release from the source board, which incidentally, as you see here below as well, then you see to the SVN repository, that's not the one I'm going to use. So CP2K has both uh, an SVN repository hosted on the website called SourceForge, which you can check out with SVN. Let's check if you're seeing all this, yeah. Uh, or they've also have, they also have a mirror of the SVN repository located hosted on GitHub. So because I want to show Git, that's the one I'm going to clone. So they've even helpfully provided the command, git clone the address from GitHub. If I didn't know where it lived, I'll just go GitHub, search CPK, I would find, okay, there's something called CPK, mirror of official SVN repository at SourceForge, synced every five minutes. So every five minutes, this, um, this Git repository on GitHub grabs the current state of the SVN, SVN repository at SourceForge. If I look at that, this is the GitHub page for CPK. 
There's a button you can say clone or download. If I click that, I get an address for where to clone from. And you see this is the same as the address that was shown on the CPTK website. So then I will change over to my terminal and let you do that as well. So go to my terminal, so I've into Archer. Now uh, I'm going to just create temporary of oh, uh, so removing my already created temporary collection. Okay, we're going to make a temporary directory, and inside that directory, I'm going to git clone, and then the address of the EGK git repository host on GitHub. You can see it's receiving objects, so it's downloading from GitHub. That's quite a nice view. Resolving deltas, so deltas already gives you some insight into, the, into how Git operates. Delta for difference, so what Git does, it cleverly stores the history of files, not simply in terms of um, the entire uh, content of the file of each version, but it stores the difference between different versions of a file, which makes sense. It's just much more efficient storage wise. That's checking out files. Okay. So that is done. Ah, so what we've done there is, there I directly checked out the original C2K repository. So although I can see what, I, what it is, I can enter that directory, I see here that now with this Git repository, there are no, no directories called branches, tags, and trunk. Instead, there is just whatever people want that to be in there's there's a set of potentials in C2K, if I go into the c if I go into the CPK subdirectory, I can see that there's stuff like source code. What I've done here is I have cloned the original um, CP2K repository from GitHub. Um, when I say original, I mean the one that's administered by the GitHub by the CPK developers. What this means is that although I can view the files and I can make changes, um, if I uh, I can make changes to a file, say and uh, open a random source file. Uh, open a random source file, input c2k uh, root .f. Uh, I can make some changes to this code. Uh, right, I can save those changes. So now if I type git status, it will notice that I've modified that file. If I want to commit that file, uh, I commit it, so I need to, um, to say that I want to commit it. So I need to add it to the so-called stage area for a commit. As I discussed earlier, that is done with the add command. So I git add uh, source input cp2k read. You don't always have to do this. Um, you can, by default, just add all everything that has changed. I've added that file. If I hit status again, now it says um, changes to be committed, modified file that I mentioned. So above, when I first said git status, it says changes not yet staged for commit that file, but now it says changes to be commit to be committed this file. Now if I want to Commit it. I type git git commit, commit dash m uh, some changes. So what this does is it has made it has committed the changes to my local copy of the repository. I type git status now. It's saying um, there's nothing to commit. However, it does say my branch, namely the branch master in my local um, repository, is ahead of origin master, and origin master is a shorthand for the remote repository on GitHub. In principle, in order to um, make these changes available to other users, I would push these changes to the repository on, Git, on GitHub. However, because I don't have uh, 
the right axis, I, I cannot actually do this. So in order to, to do that, I will need to first fork uh, the repository. So I will bring you back in the view to the browser. Um, so what I can do is a little bit bigger. I'm going back to GitHub. I'm on GitHub. And a little bit bigger thing. And I can see that um, there is a, I can't use a pointer on this, but there's a, um, there's a button in the top right called fork. If I click that fork, what it will do is it will fork a copy of the C2K repository to my own GitHub account. So you can see it gives me the option where to where to fork this. I have several several accounts, institutional account. I'll fork it to my own account. You can see it's copying. And now what I have is a copy of the C repository within my own account. You can see that the address of this is uh, within my own account. So if I want to, I can now clone this, this address for my own account, copy, and switching me back to the view of my terminal. Um, I'm going to I'm going to remove CP2K repository that I cloned from the developers directly. And instead, what I'm going to do is check out um, my fork. I think quite a lot of data because it's not just source code but also input files, potentials, potentials for um, DFT simulations. So, um, Look what's there. All the same stuff as was in the repository that was taken directly from the developers. If I go into the source code directory again and make some more the changes to the um, changes to the file. Um, blah, blah. To make some changes, and I save those changes. File, and now I am going to add. Uh, File be committed. That just shows that I'm ready to commit it. And some changes. Now I'm committing those changes to the local repository still. Now what I can do is I can push these changes um, to GitHub. Um, So you see it compresses the changes, writes them, uh, and then it's successful. So now I go to GitHub, show you the browser view. Now if I refresh that window, you will see that um, um, within the CPK folder, the comment now says some changes. If I browse to that file, what is it called again? Input uh, restart force uh, Input restart force eval. You see that the comment comment for, comment for that file 
is some changes. And changes have been have been made. This is this is this is the change I made. So as this is just an introduction, I'm not going to go any further with, with sort of putting different branches, merging branches, but um it might be in other courses. So that is a best demonstration of Git and some additional so insight into, into GitHub. Well, what I'll actually do is I'll show you the um, I'm on GitHub, and if I go back to the original repository, um, I can look at uh, commits, the commit history. That is basically the log. This is the same thing that I would see if I were to type git log. Uh, from the command line. And you can see there's a commit history here with, with, with the hashes um, and commit comments. And as well, you can see that there are, if I go back to the main page for the repository, if I go click on, um, if I click on releases, these are different uh, releases of code. And so this is a bad example for issues because I don't think CPTQ actually uses Issues tracker, which is the wiki, the wiki for reporting and resolving and discussing bugs as they emerge. But in other uh, repositories on GitHub, you will see that under issues, there's a there'll be discussion of issues, of bugs, and of uh, tracking of, of um, commits relating to these bugs. So if you've got a bug in your code and you're wondering was this fixed at any point, this is often a place to find it if the repository, if the repository for the code that you're using is hosted on GitHub. Okay, go back to the view for uh, back to the slides. So almost finished now. Um, so I've given you a basic idea of two models, centralized and distributed. And uh, an example demonstration using Git and GitHub. So just to finish off, I want to give some, some idea of the kind of workflows that you can use with uh, distributed version control systems like Git. There are certain kind of uh, common or conventional workflows which are even uh, given names. For example, uh, this one, the uh, integration manager workflow, where um, say you have two developers that are contributing to a piece of software. Each will have for a, a, a public repository uh, for example, host on GitHub or on a GitLab instance on their own local machine, uh, or I should say on a, a research group or on a company, company machine. They will have on their own, uh, say, laptops, uh, a, a, a private repository, which is just a clone of this public one. They will make changes within, within the private repository, commit them, and then push those changes to the public repository. Then, um, the integration manager, uh, some designated person, will have uh, his or her own uh, public repository, uh, or could be private. They will then either pull changes uh, from the respective develop public developer repositories, or the public developers will, when they see fit, to issue pull requests to the integration manager repository, saying, OK, I've made some changes. These are ready to be integrated into the main uh, code, I think so, please review them. So that the role of the integration manager there is to review the changes um, and to resolve any conflicts that might emerge. Um, so maybe merging uh, branches from different, these two different developers. Then once these, everything has been merged and any, every conflict has been resolved and it's been, the software has been tested and all works according to plan, everything's been integrated correctly then they can push this to a so-called, you know, it might be a blessed or canonical repository, which will be the repository that uh, will be used for, for kind of production releases, um, uh, not be made public, and so on, maybe even self sold. Um, and the public, the, the, the developers can then in turn uh, pull from that blessed repository to update the latest changes. So there's kind of a cycle going from uh, blessed repository to local, private copies from the developers, pushing their changes to the public copies, and then pushing or issuing pull requests to the integration manager repository, which is the best repository, etc. 
related model is um, um, so-called dictator and lieutenant's workflow, where developers might have uh, public repositories, then there might be various intermediate stages um, of sort of intermediate level integration managers in the form of lieutenants, and then ultimately issue uh, push up further to uh, somebody who ultimately decides uh, what gets added to the canonical repository. And this model is maybe taken from, I think, taken from the Linux kernel in particular. Um, so let's just put a few examples. So I hope that you know these two parts have given you some idea of both of, all, of why we need version control systems, why they're useful. Uh, what some common concepts are that underlie all of them, what some common terminology is, so that you sort of, it's not all probably good when, when you use them. Um, also, the big distinction between centralized and distributed version control, and the workflows that that enables. Um, and then the question remains, maybe, um, in your mind, might be, well, how do I actually use these? Well, more detailed syntax you can find help on. But the question is, if, if I'm, I'm starting from scratch, like, oh, well, what version control system should, should I use? What are, you know, which one should I use? Um, it's personal, partly, but it, it also depends. Well, my, I would argue that um, if you're joining an existing project, then you don't have a choice, typically. You just use whatever's already being used. Uh, unless there's big issues with what's being used currently, in which case, you can suggest something else. Uh, if you are kind of loosely working with collaborators and none of you really use a control system yet, um, you could decide uh, by consensus on something. But um, yeah, if you have some important collaborators that are already using something, you just use what's already used. My suggestion would be to experiment. Um, being aware that Git um, and Mercurial are, in, in a way, um, quite easy to set up and it will allow you just to immediately start, immediately create a new repository with a single command and to immediately start committing uh, to this privately just within your, on your own machine. And Git in particular is extremely uh, powerful and flexible. Uh, but uh, there is however a risk that in Git, because it's so flexible, it is actually quite complex and there are a lot of options, it's easy to get lost. And sometimes the syntax isn't most, most obvious. Um, so the advantage is that you can use GitHub to, um, to host and share your files. Um, I, would, I would actually argue that Mercurial is, uh, is quite a nice in-between solution in between SVN and Git in that it offers you uh, distributed version control um, but with a syntax that is a lot more, uh, much simpler, a lot easier, and that's easy to get yourself tied in knots of that. Um, so, yeah, that is basically what I wanted to um, tell you about the introducing version control, uh, some, some references, for Git and SVN, um, and I'm um, open to any questions if anybody wants to ask anything. What tools do you use to manage your merger? Um, so, Simply using uh, a version control system from the command line will, when you update or push, prompt you with um, choices to merge. And then it can be as simple as simply uh, telling you, okay, here is some conflict. Open, you know, uh, immediately say what to do. Either ignore the ones that you, ignore the one that you're pulling from, or ignore the one that you're pushing to, and just replace it, or actually uh, edit and, and, and sort it out yourself. And editing and sorting out yourself then brings up a text editor, your favorite text editor. You can say which one to open, and you go in, and it's it will have the tool, what it'll have done, it will have marked out um, uh, the, the particular position in the file where the conflict uh, occurs, and it, it will mark out lines that were in the one version, lines that are in the other version, other version, and it'll basically kind of say, edit here, uh, you have to go in and actually make these changes and save these changes. Um, and then once that's saved, and you, if you close the, edit, close the editor, and in line with the kind of workflow of, of the, having issued the command for the, the, 
merge it with a pull or push, the version control system will then take the result of the file you saved and commit that as the merged result. So that's the way that you often do this um, in a terminal from the command line with your favorite editor, um, uh, which is you know, useful to be able to do if you're doing this uh, uh, not just on the laptop, but also on the remote machine that you're logged into, in which case you might be able to get a very gooey up a more complicated um, uh, system. But uh, there are other tools, you know, more fancy graphical interfaces. You can download app, you know, applications for, uh, for, for your laptop, like uh, your local machine that allow you to do things visually and, and to, 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 to do this in an interface that is a bit more kind of maybe user friendly. Uh, okay, then, then, but, uh, just that first, before I go on to uh, the next question from Paul, does that answer the question, Lars? Okay, Paul, how do you start development branches? Uh, and oh, right. how do you start development branches? Okay, um, so this depends a bit on the, um, on the tool in particular. So, um, in Git, you will say, for example, uh, git branch, uh, this is our syntax, you can write git branch. I'll, I'll give you, I'll just share my screen. Uh, yeah, the git, okay. Um, so if I share, give it in application terminal. Uh, okay. So, um, so I'm in this. I'm in my. I'm on Archer. I am browsing the uh, local repository. Uh, Clone my fork, and if I type git branch, that will show what branches what branch I'm currently on. I do git branch branch A. That will show me uh, the most branches. I do git branch dash dash. Well, this create or delete branches. So, um, it, mm -hmm. okay. If I'm here, that's okay. Okay. Branch. So I've typed git branch new, and you can see that when I do git branch, it shows me that there are two branches, master and new. Uh, I'm currently still on master, so any changes I make will assume, will, if I, any changes I make which I then commit will be committed to master. Uh, if I want to make changes to, to new, I need to do git checkout new, switch to branch new. If I then type git branch, you will see that the asterisk has moved from master to new, and now on a new branch. And you can see that um, all the changes are, uh, oh, sorry, all the um, all the files that were that were visible in, when I was on the master branch are also visible in the new branch. However, this is a distinct copy, right? So if I make any changes to these files and commit them, this these changes will be committed only to the new branch, and uh, the, the copy of the set of files in on the master branch will remain unchanged. So does that answer the first question? Okay, second, uh, second part of the question is granting right access to other users done through the web interface, which is big packets or, or GitHub. Um, yes, uh, yep. So you add, um, let's see if I can move. Uh, so if I switch focus to application share um, desktop, I mean uh, browser, 
Okay, so in the browser, so I will go to I will go to my I will go to my fork of the CP2K repository and um, let's see uh, I want to uh, allow somebody to invite um, to this. <laughs> settings. Collab ah, settings, collaborators. Okay. Collaborators. Okay, this repository doesn't have any collaborators yet. Use the form below to add a collaborator. So, do you have a or do you have a, um, a username on GitHub by any chance? Oh, okay, no worries. Um, but um, if I were to add, say, uh, so do I have oh, some options? I'm not going to simply add, random, <laughs> add a random uh, user to my collaborator because if that notification, that'd be odd. Um, but if I were to add, um, well, um, okay, so you can add, if you add an email person or correspond to an account, they'll get a notification. Anyway, that's that's the way to do it. So once you've done that, then they will be listed. So what I can do is I can go to actually the original CTK repository and look, I can look at what's there in terms of uh, in terms of collaborators. This is, this is the original one, and I see that there's two contributors listed. Although, of course, here I cannot add contributors. I can see what's been, what has been added and who is allowed to um, contribute to so data here. Okay. Yeah, okay. So this is just an idea, right? So you can see there's two users here who can contribute. That's, yeah, that's basically, that's typically how it works. You can optimize users without the web um, interface. Any more questions? As I said earlier, actually, there should be um, there's a there's a scripted practical for using SVN available from um, I'll just find the link now. Actually, past past instance of this scripted tutorial. Um, now the, the website that was being used to host the SVN or suggested that you use when you like to host the SVN repository when you do the practical actually no longer operates in exactly the same way so it needs to be modified somewhat but there should be a, a scripted practical that will go online um, at, at the place where you found the link to the collaborative session for this tutorial um, so uh, let's see if I can uh, I will paste the link in, uh, in the chat window. This is a, so this is a version which gives you, which is this practical uh, previous version of the, um, this tutorial. The website mentioned Assembla doesn't necessarily work in exactly the same way. So this will be updated and the link will be placed on the um, by uh, by the links for this particular uh, version tutorial on the Archer website. So any other questions? In which case, uh, thank you for attending, and I hope that you uh, find uh, this um, version very useful. I, I'll leave you with one, uh, one little note. Um, from experience, uh, let's see. Let me try the application. So, a word of warning if you are going to use um, it in particular. So um, I'll leave you with, with that thought. So thank you for attending.